questions now. Thanks very much, Alicia, for introducing. And thanks to the organizers for giving me this great opportunity to introduce a field here, a little bit also of pers a personal perspective, shaping atoms and molecules with strong fields. So this will be a more recent perspective. <coughs> and let me give you a little bit, oh, I guess I have to stand close to the microphone, right? Uh, which is not so easy, maybe I can do it that way. Uh, a little bit of an outline of what I'm gonna talk about and what I will cover and will not cover, as you will see, of course, during the talk. So I will give an introduction of what I mean here, really, by the shape of atoms. And we've actually heard a lot already, uh, just now in the previous tutorial, and so this is perfect, perfect set. So, um, and also what happens to atoms as we let them interact with strong fields and how this will change the shape. What I will not talk in this bit more, is uh, it will be about strong field physics, but I will not talk about what so far is the major part of strong field physics. So what happens during ionization and how do uh, basically how we generate ions. And so this will basically not involve a lot of ion measurements or electron spectroscopy, but other methods that are also viable to observe how a neutral, a neutral system, a neutral atom, a neutral molecule would change its shape, its spectrum, or its structure in a strong field. So this, this is what will be the focus. So can we also see things as they would change in even a neutral atom, a neutral molecule interacting with a strong laser field? Mm -hmm. so. so like excitation? Excitation things, exactly, for example. And of course in the end I hope we will answer or address at least this question, what do we learn and where do we go with all this? And then maybe we can also talk about your questions about this. So, the shape of atoms, that's it, and it's very simple, I want to start simple. In the energy domain, it's the spectrum. This is giving basically the spectral shape, if you so wish, on the energy landscape. And of course, there is the real space, structural shape, orbitals, and what you can do, of course, is you can let them interact with light. You can absorb a single photon and promote a system from the ground state to an excited state, of course, also into the continuum. And this is done typically even with very weak light. It's a single photon perturbative transition, and you can look at these states, and you can do that with very, very high precision using these single photon weak fields, in fact, very weak fields to not perturb the system. You can set up atomic locks this way. You can build very, very stable, now 10 to the minus 18, I think is still the uh, stability record for a single ion and also lattice clocks that you can build now based on these uh, well-defined systems, atoms and molecules, very well-defined systems. You can use these frequency comb methods where you have a perfect ruler of frequencies going all the way to zero and can measure these frequencies very nicely. Also, you could look at drifts between them or just, as I said, use them for atomic, very precise optical atomic clocks with huge um, stabilities. Of course, the field goes all the way back, spectroscopy, mm, to even the, well, <laughs> now two centuries ago, 1860s, where people looked at the this, this spectra that are emitted from atoms as you would just expose them, for example, to heat, excite them by heat, and you could see that this is discrete lines, and of course this was what gave rise to the discovery of quantum mechanics, that there's only particular transitions and all this. So this is a fairly fundamental structural property that basically let people at uh, these days here at some point then define what is really the shape of atoms in the quantum mechanical sense. This you can see also when you just look at photons being scattered of these systems or fluorescing, or of course when you shine photons through atomic clouds, for example as Fraunhofer did some while back when he, okay this is just what absorption spectroscopy is, but when you look at the sun and the sun has, of course, the solar atmosphere. You shine this then onto your spectrometer. What is emitted by the sun, you see characteristic absorption dips. And uh, this was also discovered a long time ago. Here, as, as I said, Fraunhofer uh, identified then these dips with particular atom species that live in the solar spectrum. What I want to make the point here is that this is one other thing about the shape of atoms. It's really not just where these lines are, this is spectroscopy, but of course what you can also look at is the line width. It tells you about the lifetimes in these systems, so how long does a particular excited state live 
and also the line shapes. And this is just two uh, line shapes here. For example, a Lorentzian line shape that just happens when you have a lifetime broadened state. It just exponentially decays. And that's what you get for the line shape. It's a Lorentzian or Gaussian if you have other effects like, for example, pressure broadening or rather um, um, Doppler broadening, for example, in a thermal gas, then you get a different line shape, which is then a Gaussian shape. And from these line shapes also, then you can infer about the atoms internal or also the environmental structure of the atomic cloud. And I will show you a very not another important line shape that actually also came up in the first talk later on, which is the Fano line shape. But let me go on uh, a little bit uh, further first. The shape of atoms we discussed now and this for weak light, but of course, when you now go to a very intense light field, which you can make with lasers, uh, of course, nowadays very easily, so basically apply field strengths that get close to the intra-atomic field strengths that hold the atoms uh, or the electrons in place in the atoms, you will significantly change now this structure, this, the real space structure and also the spectral structure. And this is what, we, uh, what I will talk about uh, afterwards. So what happens to the spectral structure and what happens in particular when you have very, very short pulsed fields interacting with the atoms. So all this with strong fields, you could say here, what also can happen, you can absorb several photons in this picture when you go from the ground state then into the continuum. And even within the continuum, we can keep absorbing uh, photons. And this leads to this about threshold ionization. An early paper here is, for example, this by Pierre Agostini. Uh, in 97, uh, 79, sorry, where he saw this, uh, this above threshold ionization. So also what changes in these strong fields. Another thing, of course, this is multi-photon uh, ionization, but of course what happens in very low frequency fields is the fact that you, again, here another structural change, if you so wish, in an atom, you really change the binding potential, you could imagine, in this, in, at least in this, in this picture. And something interesting can happen that you create basically a situation where the atom can tunnel, the electron can tunnel out of the atom to create this ionization. And this is actually the one exception I want to present uh, about the ionization, just to mention this. And there's an interesting, of course, this is an interesting story about this strong field ionization in general, because there's now for a long time, there have been these measurements with the so-called ATO clocks, for example. There was, I think, one of the very first papers in Ursula Keller's group where they applied a close to circular elliptically polarized field to this situation, basically really distort the binding potential of an atom very much, like shown here. And what is usually happening, the electron would escape always perpendicular to the major polarization axis of the field. So along the minor polarization axis, the electron would escape with a maximum uh, momentum. And so by the tilt of this ellipse, you could then think if the electron would tunnel out, not at the maximum of the field, but slightly later with a certain delay, you would see this by the tilt of this ellipse. This was the kind of very simple picture people had in mind for this. And with this picture in mind, people set out then to measure something. At first, they could measure, of course, here the difference in angle between the, between the minor uh, axis of this ellipse and where the electrons with the maximum momentum came out. This can be measured, and this is not zero. And starting from this, a huge controversy emerged about now measuring the time it takes for this electron to go through the tunnel. And I just want to bring this up because this is just interesting to discuss in this, in this situation. It almost seems like it's a never ending controversy. So there are several papers now, also recent ones, in the Keller group again, 2014, where they claim that the tunneling time is a finite time on this order here of, well, depending on intensity, 100 to sub 50 attoseconds, and you can measure this. But also other papers are around that say, well, this is not true. This model that is used there is wrong. Uh, so actually, the tunneling time comes out as zero, use, using a different theory to describe this. And in that, comparing this to the experiments, the tunnel time would be zero. There is another very recent uh, work uh, by the Litvinuk uh, group that will, I think, also be presented here at the conference on, if I'm, I think, on Thursday, if I'm not wrong, um, which also shows in comparison with experiments that the tunnel time actually in that particular comparison of theory and experiment is zero. So where's this problem? So there's all these different things, but what, what the key problem in this is, can you actually measure a tunnel time? And in fact, what you can see in quantum mechanics, there is no operator for time. So in, in fact, 
this means time directly, it's not an observable. You can always, of course, this is what also the precision guys do, define a time standard, and basically count clicks of a, of a, of a frequency, basically of some, fundamental, of some fundamental pendulum, which can be an optical frequency. But the problem in this particular experiment is not just to define really a time standard, but also the mapping of the quantum process, the tunneling, into a classical process that is then basically the measurement on the detector, where you cross over from this tunnel to saying at this point it has tunneled out and this is happening at that and that time before the electronic motion turns into this trajectory that you measure with a, um, with a detector at some point. And of course, this has to be done all in a consistent manner and the question is whether there will be a unique answer to this because, so this is another recent paper on this, where now with very, very high precision, what, what was done is to compare two species of two different gases in a coincidence experiment, basically in the same target gas under completely identical conditions. And this allowed to measure very, very finely the angular offset between two electrons coming out. And this was done together with the Keitel group at Heidelberg, who did the theory based on the so-called Wigner time. And this theory included now a tunneling time and a momentum. And it turns out that when you compare this theory, this Wigner time definition with the experiment, that you get a perfect agreement only if you assume a finite tunnel time, but also a finite longitudinal momentum at the tunnel point. So if you do that, then you get this finite time. This does not mean that any of the other things now are not true. And this is the general point that I want to make. There could be several theoretical approaches that all define this tunnel time consistently and lead up to agreement with the experiment. So it cannot be said, I think, that some of this is now right or wrong, but all this is, is, could be completely true within the set of definitions that are chosen for the theory. This is what I want to bring up for this point about this emerging and still not over controversy about tunneling times, that it could turn out there is not the right theory to explain that and not the only answer to this, to this point. Okay, let me get, get back on track, yes. But are you saying there isn't the right theory? There is the right theory, but it could be that not there, is, there is not just one right theory. I would say, because all theory is describing something in physics, and who knows whether just well, that well, one theory could go there or not another picture could also explain this. Alternate fact. It's not an alternate fact. <laughs> this, is, this is a different thing <laughs> completely. All right. All right, let me get back on track to now what we also, what I want to show today. So this is showing even that even for this very simple single electron problem in strong fields, there could be controversies all over the place. And this is just a single electron interacting with fields. In fact, this was here really done for, as I should point out, for a hydrogen atom. So it's, it's a really clean, very nice experiment uh, that was done here really for the pure hydrogen case. But still it seems that problems involving strong fields are difficult. So even just looking at one electron is, an, is a hard problem with strong fields. But of course, to be clear, there's more than one electron. And things get particularly interesting if you now have two electrons or more and let them expose, uh, be exposed to these strong fields and see what's happening in this situation. So this is just the illustration what, again, ionization looks like of a single atom, a single electron atom. But the goal could be in this entire thing with strong fields to understand really how few body dynamics proceeds in strong fields. This is the real challenge if you have not just one electron, but even several electrons, what do you do in this case? Can you still understand anything? And if you can, this has a large number of interesting applications which go into all kinds of, uh, of current uh, interest. For example, shoot movies of uh, single molecules, which of course have several electrons in intense X-ray uh, fields, as they produce at free electron lasers. Petahertz uh, clocked computing, if you manage to steer several electrons around molecules and control the interactions at some point with lasers. X-ray precision spectroscopy, I won't cover that today, but it has interesting ex uh, uh, also applications here. Or of course, finally, if you understand all this, you can control large molecules with lasers at some point and know what you do, so in fact. Um, all right, all this again sketched here, look at systems of various complexity, more complex, but don't forget sometimes to look even at very, very simple systems to really understand what's happening in the strong field case. And the tools we really need for this are 
photon energies in the, well, EV, tens of EV, sometimes XUV and X-ray range. Why? Because if you want to look at electronic excitations within these atoms, depending on what excitation you want to look at, sometimes even core excitations, you need these high photon energies because this is just the characteristic energy scale of these electronic excitations. And fortunately, this light is now provided in several ways, either at free electron lasers that are popping up around the world, various places, and also by procedures in the lab to turn your optical laser into an XUV source with also very short pulsed uh, properties. So two applications, two various ways to, to deal with this, either large scale facilities or lab facilities or uh, tabletop if you want, each with their own set of advantages or disadvantages. So the free electron lasers are now basically really the choice if you want to have very short wavelengths with very high pulse energy, so lots of photons in a single pulse. This is what you do at, FE, uh, at FELs. They also have very, very short pulse duration, which is not yet perfectly controlled. This is basically the point where sometimes, so far at least, the high harmonic sources have advantages. They are very short and they are perfectly synchronized to optical fields. But if you want to use optical and XUV somehow, to want to understand what happens in your optical pulse, in the strong field of an optical pulse, you then have a perfectly synchronized XUV pulse by these methods. But I will show you also later that each of these approaches has also, in terms of just what you do, pros and cons or different applications in mind. So for free electron lasers, for example, you can do things like really X-ray diffraction of even now gas phase molecules. You can do this and see really what happens directly and basically get a direct image or at least a case-based image of your processes and with this, you can do XUV spectroscopy. You can look at lines in the XUV spectrum that are characteristic of excitations and how they would change now in this strong laser field that you expose atoms and molecules with. And with this, you can do time-resolved imaging, basically. You now have two pulses. You shoot two pulses with a well-controlled time delay in your experiment at a system of atoms, molecules in the gas phase. You can record electrons and ions. But of course, you can also collect all these other things that I've showed you before, photons as they are emitted, as they are basically transmitted through the medium and absorbed in several places, you get absorption lines. Or as I said, you can now with the free electron lasers directly get images, diffraction images of very small uh, systems here. <coughs> and this is what I will focus on. So I will focus basically on these photon uh, things photon diagnostics, either diffractive imaging or XUV spectroscopy for understanding what happens in strong fields in atoms and molecules. This gives you another advantage. It gives you the advantage of not just seeing where are these lines and what are their relative strengths. It gives you now, in addition to this, uh, to this line strength, absorption strength information, it gives you information about the phases with which these superpositions of states in atoms and molecules evolve in time. After you excite them with an XUV pulse, you create a wave packet in the atom and the molecule, and now choosing basically a time delay between your exciting pulse and an infrared laser pulse, for example, you can probe as a function of time how these absorption lines would change, and this gives you also information about the phases in the system and how the wave packet really looks like, and if you go to higher field strength of your IR pulse, how would it modify these wave packets? So this is the goal. And this is the question, basically, that we and many others, as I've shown here, there's a lot of people now in this field of XUV, time-dependent XUV absorption spectroscopy. Uh, what happens if you now let systems, very small systems, interact with very strong fields? Well, not very strong fields, actually moderately strong, such just that they wiggle around the electrons a lot in these systems, and in short, on short time scales. Why is this um, interesting? So there's several places in current science uh, interest of, other, of a lot of people of the community where this plays a role. Already traditionally here, Freeman resonances in strong field ionization were discovered after the first above threshold ionization measurements. There's resonances taking part in above threshold ionization in strong fields, and you can see them in spectra, and they play a role in promoting the electrons out. This is here a more recent work uh, by the Eichmann group at Berlin, frustrated tunnel ionization, again seeing that even after a strong field pulse has ionized the system dramatically, there are excitations surviving this strong laser field in very highly excited 
uh, Rydberg states, and this is called frustrated tunneling because the electron in a way never even was ionized. It was basically just driven within the atom and the end was just promoted to an excited state, uh, an excited Rydberg state. A free electron laser, multiple excitation by X-rays. So even if you have high intense X-ray fields, you can find out here in these experiments uh, that this was a large uh, collaboration here. Um, Atom Rudenko was, uh, um, and, and uh, um, Daniel Hollis were main authors on this, so that you could then only get agreement with your experimental data in this ex in this ionization experiments that we that we only get agreement when you included the role of resonances in this X-ray field. So also there on short timescales, these resonances in the X-ray domain play a role. And of course, certainly when you think about things like tracking excitations moving through molecules, charge migration, this is of course also excitations, coherent excitations in molecules that you probe with a laser field in a strong field environment very often. And you have to understand how these resonances really interact or are changed by your strong field that you use for probing. So this general question, how do resonances and bound states change in strong fields, this plays a large role everywhere basically uh, in, in uh, recent uh, science, at least this uh, time resolved uh, application that I've showed. You could ask, why is this still necessary? Why do we still need to care about this? Because the coupling of states in strong fields is actually quite well known. So it goes also here way back to if you think about just coupling one state to another one with a laser field, well, this is very simple. You could say you just take this, um, how do you say, the rotating wave approximation, you solve this for this Hamiltonian, this is what turns out, and you get basically the two resonances here, and they basically repel each other, you could say. Yeah? So as you crank up the coupling strength, you get this situation here after you diagonalize the Hamiltonian for various amounts of this coupling strength. If you enter it, you get this situation. You can also couple one to several states. This has also, also been solved, at least for special cases, for example, here by the bright Rabi formula. If you think of states in a magnetic field, but it doesn't really matter what is the interaction. Could be a magnetic field, could be an electric field. Here, this was for basically spin orbit split states or spin orbit interacting states in a magnetic field, where you could then see also here, the states would somehow repel each other and change. And you would see then, depending on what is your coupling between the strength, you would see different spectra. The lines would just shift to different places as you increase the coupling. Another thing, important thing, uh, was the, the um, work by Fano, where he treated the coupling of a discrete state, not just in a finite set of states, but in a continuum. So where you have basically now a resonance, which is coupling to a continuum of states, if it lives in the ionization continuum. And what he did basically is to diagonalize the Hamiltonian then, which contains this one resonance state with energy E and this set of continuum energies around it, epsilon, and the coupling between them. Yeah? And what he came up in this situation is not that just the line would now change and move to a different place, but it would actually change the shape. So if you do red spectroscopy now on such a state, you would not just see another Lorentzian, which is shifted as in these cases, but it's really a line shape that is modified, that gets even asymmetric and can be described the absorption profile by this formula that Fano found. So this is the Fano absorption cross-section and characterize this, this is characterized this asymmetry by this Q parameter. This will become important later. The Q parameter in here is telling you, for example, whether the resonance looks like this, goes slowly down and quickly up in absorption, or it goes the other way, goes slowly uh, up and quickly down uh, from the other side. So if the Q is negative, it looks one way, positive, it's the other way. If the Q goes to infinity, plus or minus infinity, it approaches again the Lorentzian, and anywhere in between it's a, an asymmetric uh, line shape, except for zero, then it's a dip in the absorption spectrum. So you could say, all right, this is all understood, what do we do now? So the coupling case, even for very strong, strong fields, yeah, when you drive up the interaction to strong parameters, in a, in a way understood, what would we still need to do? Well, this is all fine, as long as the coupling can be considered adiabatic and you just diagonalize these Hamiltonians, all this is fine. But what happens now when you only, as in the recent cases with lasers, have the coupling for a very short time? You apply a strong laser pulse, but on a time which is much shorter than the interatomic or intermolecular dynamics. So very short pulse interacts with the system and what happens in this case? And this was not really considered uh, so much as it turns out. A nice system to look for such uh, uh, dynamics is the helium atom because it features basically all of these 
things that I've talked about in, uh, in the, on this slide. It has several states that can, that can couple to each other. And more than that, it has even this special case of states living in the continuum, where you excite basically both electrons from the ground state to a doubly excited state where both electrons are excited, one, for example, to the 2s, the other one to the 2p, or even higher, 2s uh, and the other one to the 3p, and then even things like um, this, is even, this is even entangled or correlated <coughs> states where you have basically a superposition of several states that describe these um, doubly excited states here. So it has a lot of these interesting things, and they live in the continuum. So basically, when you excite both electrons now with a single photon, you can do that because they are correlated, two excited states, what will happen? They auto-ionize, so one electron again drops back down to the ground state, and this is enough energy that this one releases that the other one can be ionized. You can also think of this in that representation here. One drops back down, this is more than enough energy for the second one to leave the system. This is auto-ionization, and basically just means the state is higher up in energy than it would take to, for one electron to be ionized. So these states live in the ionization continuum of this singly ionized system. And Fano found out here, he can get this asymmetric absorption profile for these states, which is characterized by the Q parameter, which in turn is a composite of these terms. So basically you have the dipole matrix element from the ground state to the doubly excited state in here, the dipole matrix element from the ground state to the continuum. You know, this is the this is the de uh, de denominator here. And the so-called configuration interaction, VCI, is basically the matrix element between the doubly excited state and the continuum with one over R, the electron distance in between. So this is basically what's characterizing electron repulsion between the doubly excited state and the continuum. So this is what Fano found out. And with this, he could describe basically the shape perfectly of these helium resonances, what they, what they looked like. What now can be done with current technology is to excite this system of helium with a coherent broadband pulse of XUV light, which is basically available by these attosecond pulses, around 60 EV, where these doubly excited states are, and create a coherent superposition of several of these doubly excited states. Basically, if you so wish, a two-electron wave packet. And because you have this perfectly synchronized uh, laser pulse now available. You can now look at how these doubly excited states couple to each other or to other continua if you let them interact, drive this system now with a strong field, how would it change the shape of the system or the spectrum of the system? And this is what a lot of people already have done, uh, looked at also in theory for a long time. There's the work of Lampopoulos, which started very early on such processes, doubly excited states in strong fields, in particular in helium, also the work of C.D. Lin's group a long time ago. There were also experimental realizations in the Leone group, also supported by Chris theory already back then. Uh, in Senkyu Chang's group, uh, there were experiments on, with photoionization being done on this. The challenge previously was always to link, and this is important in these experiments, to bring together high temporal resolution of this time delay that you control in the experiment and still be able to measure the line shapes <coughs> with high spectral resolution. Why is this important? You can look at this spectrum here that was now acquired here with, this, with an apparatus that looks like this. So you generate high harmonics in an atomic cloud of neon in this case with an intense IR pulse about 10 to the 14-ish watts per square centimeter. You generate these XUV pulses, these attosecond pulsed uh, lights that is locked to this pulse here, to this driver pulse. So this is basically on a, on a phase cycle of the infrared light, you have a perfect locking of these pulses to this visible or near, near visible, near infrared pulse of your laser. Then you put this light across a toroidal focusing mirror, so this is a few experimental details, um, onto a split mirror, which is basically composed of two mirrors that can be used to now control the time delay between the infrared and the XUV pulse with very high precision, and send then again this, this pair of pulses through this cell filled with helium gas and transmitted through the helium 
to afterwards look at what has been absorbed from the spectrum. And since the pulse is so broad in frequency, you get basically spectra like this without tuning anything in the spectrometer. You just park your spectrometer somewhere and it will record this spectrum as you let it integrate on your camera chip. So the spectrum is broad enough to cover actually much broader than this uh, 58 to 66, spans 20 EV or even more. And you can record these line shapes. And as you can see, to really tell what the line shape is, you need to resolve this now with about a few tens of milli electron volts to really be able to really reconstruct the full line shape of these doubly excited states, these Fano lines. And what is interesting afterwards, you can then tune your time delay between this infrared pulse and the XUV pulse to really look how does now my fundamental helium system change in this strong field environment. And you can see really the lines change dramatically depending on the time delay. And this is what, what uh, is interesting to be understood because it opens a couple of uh, interesting other questions as you will see. This is just for, for completeness sake, the setup that is used, but this looks very much like in many other labs as well. You have basically a harmonic generation, you have a refocusing chamber, all needs to be done in vacuum because the XUV light does not propagate through air, it gets immediately basically absorbed. The refocusing and then a chamber here which supplies your target that you want to study. Afterwards comes the spectrometer and this is maybe a design view of the spectrometer where it's helpful to have a flat field spectrometer to capture this entire spectrum basically without tuning anything, just sit it parked there on the camera, you record the spectrum and what is also important here, you have a mirror which you can use for introducing this time delay, but also key here in these experiments was to have, it could be done otherwise, but it was helpful to have a grazing incidence mirror to get the entire XUV spectrum safely across into your target here for doing the experiments on the helium or any other gas. And this is what you get from such measurements. So you measure basically as a function now of the time delay, you measure your absorption spectrum. So this is the absorption spectrum in photon energy as a function of the time delay between your XUV and your near infrared pulse. And first thing you can see, for example, here in this measurement, you get this rapid ringing as a function of time delay. And you can analyze this, compare this to a few level theory model uh, uh, that we actually did ourselves. This was actually very, a very simple model here that we used for this. But what we understood from this model is that we get an interference of the doubly excited wave packet that we prepare with two XUV photons from our XUV pulse, we let this interfere with two IR photons from the laser, which comes later. And at some times you would just get constructive, but sometimes you get destructive interference. So you really map out the relative phase between these two states. And from this, you can really measure in a way the phase evolution of your wave packet, which is the missing information if you want to piece together what this wave packet looks now as a function of time. So this is what was possible afterwards with basically the theory the support of Javier Matronero, who was uh, calculating the field-free eigenstates of the helium, and Luca and uh, Argenti, maybe here, I'm not sure, but here, yeah, exactly, here he is, and Fernando Martin. So Luca did the calculations in Fernando's group here to compare this two, and this is what came out of this comparison. This is the experimentally reconstructed wave packet, two electron wave packet, position of electron one, electron two, along this cut through the atom here along a line, to represent it in two dimensions, otherwise the wave function would be basically six dimensional or it could reduce it, but this is easier to look at. And you can see that it very nicely agrees with this ab initio simulation uh, that Luca did here, where he included even all excited states. Here we reconstructed just two, and the, it seems like the two most relevant states, 2s2p and sp23+, and you get very nice agreement uh, with this calculation. But this is also just still uh, a bit of, okay, some other experimental detail here I want to show you. You need very high resolution, as I said, in the time delay and the spectral resolution to really be able to watch not only this rippling, but these uh, very fine changes of the structure here. And in fact, you can see there is a Fano line profile where it gets dark and bright afterwards again. It's appearing and disappearing. And this, this has uh, important implications for later, as I will now talk about. Because the thing is, it gets really interesting now when you increase the intensity. So this wave packet is nice, but it's basically, it's basically a test that this, this approach works. Yeah? 
So this wave packet reconstruction is nice, but this was done at a very low field strength such that one can be able or sure that the laser field that's used for probing does not modify the dynamics. So the actual question is now what happens as we now crank up the intensity? And this is what I will show you now. So as you crank up the laser intensity, you are able to still measure this absorption spectrum, but now you can see there is interesting features emerging. So at low intensities, you still get this rippling, so at low intensities, but then interesting things happen, for example, on this 2S2P doubly excited state. So it completely changes its structure. As you can see here, it develops a side peak, which then also widens up. The other states also change in an interesting fashion, as you will soon see a bit more in detail. And at the highest intensities, you see that you completely blow away the states here. In the overlap region between the XUV and the IR, the states are completely gone, which is also understandable because at some high intensities, you just really ionize everything at the atom, which just doesn't survive anymore. What you can do now is you set a fixed time delay in this data set, it's a three-dimensional data set, and you look at it as a function of intensity. So you can now clearly see how this additional line grows in and then repels from the other line, and you can see how these other states here also do an interesting change. These more highly excited states in the Rydberg series, sp23+, 24, 25, and so on, they flip basically their structure from the original Fano line shape to an inverted shape. So they go slowly up, quickly down here, when you go to higher intensities, they go slowly down in absorption and quickly up. So they just have reversed, it looks like, the Fano Q parameter. And this is also what we thought in the beginning was happening. So that it's just a change of the Q parameter that this strong field induces. But we found out later, it does not describe it. We actually get even contradictions when we apply this because Fano formulated this theory, formulated this theory under the assumption that the, the interaction, for example, this configuration interaction between two electrons is acting all the time. The electrons always repel each other. Whereas here, we have just this very brief interaction with this very intense field where we turn on a coupling and it's gone very quickly afterwards again. And this is a different situation. So this led us to think what really happens in this absorption process of a photon and what happens as we interfere into this absorption process now with our intense pulsed light. And this is actually interesting to be understood. So here I introduce a little bit of the, the way that we think about these things, how we can also make the connection between the experiment to simulations, if you like. So you can write, and interesting in this respect is to think about it, about the physics that goes on in the refractive index picture. Because this is what governs absorption in a way, or it's easy to understand in that particular scenario. So what you have is your electric field as it propagates E of X and T, just consider a plane wave in X and forget about the other dimensions. So what you can do here, you have the typical K in a medium of gas, for example, which is then a refractive index of that gas times omega over the vacuum speed of light. And you can rewrite this, insert the refractive index, and it has a real and an imaginary component. The real component of the uh, refractive index is what changes basically the wavelength in the medium. The imaginary part of this thing, which is what you see when you insert it, is what causes a decay of the electric field as it propagates. So you can basically see, if you plot this, when you have the imaginary part of the refractive index times the K in vacuum, gives you basically something like the absorption length in the medium, one over this. You know? So this is what, when the light field has dropped to one over E. So in this, in this representation, it's easy to think about the refractive index about this uh, absorption coefficient to make this link between the two. The macroscopic polarization here, P, is linked via the susceptibility to the electric field. So this is a new thing, it has nothing to do with what I just said. Let's consider just this again, just be reminded. This is again here, the chi is related to the, uh, the relative permittivity by this very simple formula that you can also always rederive if you look at just these simple definitions. Here you can insert this, the P from here, and you see that this is the epsilon R minus one. And you get the polarization is basically the density, this is the density of your emitters, the dipoles in the medium times the dipole moment. If you put all this together and, and look at what the refractive index in the Maxwell equation, you can see the refractive index squared is, the uh, um, is also the relative uh, permittivity. If you put all this together, then you can write the refractive index as one plus rho d over e, if you Taylor expand this thing, which you can because you go through a gas which has a very low chi, okay? You can Taylor expand this, you end up with this expression, and this is what you get. And this leads to a relative change of the refractive index 
being rho, the density, times the dipole moment over the electric field. And this will be important. So the imaginary part of this quantity gives you the absorption. Dipole of omega over the electric field. Very simple. And with that, one understands a whole lot. If you look at this now, what happens in a very, very simple system, just a two-level system for a very brief pulse of XUV light, as we have in the case for these attosecond pulses, it excites, it creates a coherent superposition, rather, of the ground and the excited state. Because it's very weak, it will not cause inversion, it will always cause this just coherent superposition of the states, it causes this ringing polarization term, which will follow the light pulse. So in fact, if you look at the propagating light field, this is what it will look like after it went through the medium. It has this tail. And if you do the Fourier transform of this ringing dipole response, the Fourier transform of this, this is the dipole in omega domain, and this is what I've just written down, this thing divided by the electric field of omega which for a delta function, as we use here for excitation, is a constant, this is a constant, you get the refractive index change. And this is why the Fourier transform of this thing, imaginary part, is really the changing refractive index, is the absorption, okay? The imaginary part of this is the absorption. Okay, what happens now if we follow this excitation immediately by a strong pulse? What we do, as you've seen, you shift the energy, for example, of the excited state by a start shift, for a short moment, and you get basically onto your dipole response, now a very small phase shift, delta E, the, the energy shift times delta T, the just short time scale that the pulse interacted with the system, the phase is shifted, and if you fully transform this phase shifted response, you get something that al already looks like a Fano line shape. And in fact, we've been able to show that in this assumption with a very short pulse right after the excitation, it can be directly equated there is a direct relation between the Fano Q parameter and this phase shift. And this is nice. So this work was done here with Chris Green uh, and a few years ago, three years or four years ago now actually. And you can now think of this basically a phase shifted, a phase shifted Lorentzian resonance, just including this additional phase shift to the Lorentzian kernel, imaginary part of it because of the absorption, is, can be directly equated plus a constant with the Fano formula. So basically what this tells you is via this phase shift that a laser could do to a state, you can change the Q parameter. And to check that this is actually true, we started from doubly excited helium and were able with a given laser intensity to shift the Fano lines, transform the Fano lines of the doubly excited states into Lorentzian lines by basically removing the natural line shift on the Fano resonance that is always there based on configuration interaction. On the other hand, we could start out what we've done then with singly excited helium which originally looks Lorentzian, and transform this into Fano lines. So basically you can now transform a Fano line into a Lorentzian and back start out from a non, basically, Fano system and make it one by introducing this phase shift artificially. So this is again just looking at what happens at various laser intensities as you tune through the laser intensity, start with the Fano line, you go through the symmetric and even invert the Fano line shape at the higher laser intensity. The same for the singly excited state, you start with symmetric lines and you turn them into Fano lines as you crank up the intensity. Why am I showing this? This is, this is turning basically now the Fano line shape that you can measure from your data in a strong field case into a metrology tool. So you can now assign basically each of these lines for different intensities a phase shift. And this phase shift you can now use for very precise ca um, comparisons to theory. For even a simple system, you can now compare the phase shifts that emerge in the strong field driven helium to a simple theory to see whether it captures all this dynamics. And the thing is, we still, yes, get a very good agreement on some of the states, but on some others, there is still a discrepancy and one can still wonder what that is now. Is the experiment not well characterized or is something still missing in the theory? So this is something that one can now look at with very high precision in these experiments to compare our understanding of theory with experiments. So you can basically, in strong field situations, have now a nice metrology tool by these phase shifts to make precise comparisons of, to our understanding uh, in, uh, in simple systems and more complex systems. And of course, this also gives you a handle to control these phases to control wave packets, in this case, a two electron wave packet. This was all just showing you what you could do with one pulse right after the excitation. But of course, you could generalize this to different time delays of this excitation, changing phase and amplitude after your excitation pulse. And you can turn this into just a generalized change, which basically means you change the phase or the amplitude. 
and you express this by this a, you, by this complex factor a that you multiply on your on your dipole response at any given time. It's an a of tau. So at any given time delay, you could have this modification. And it turns out there is even an analytical formula that Alexander Blattermann developed here. You can read this if you're interested in this paper that quantifies now these interactions, these short pulse interactions at any time delay in phase and amplitude. And there is a particular interesting case where you use this A and set it to zero. So you turn off your resonant emission of your resonance after a certain time delay tau by using a very intense laser pulse, for example, you can terminate the dipole response by having a zero high intense field to ionize, for example, the system. And this gives you basically a phase, a, te a temporal gate in which you can uh, measure how the resonance would look like if it would just evolve for a certain time. And this was here, I won't mention much about this because Alexander Letterman will talk about this later uh, during the conference, how such a Fano line shape builds up now in real time. And compare this to early predictions here, Wickenhauser by the Burgdorfer group, and also this was done in cooperation with the Burgdorfer people and with Chidong uh, Lin's theory group, and you could see that this is a tool now to really time resolve resonances, Fano resonances, or any other even overlapping resonances you can basically analyze now with this time gating approach. And it was also interesting, this appeared together with a photoelectron spectroscopy study on looking at the Fano resonance also as it builds up in time, looking from outside with photo emission. So basically this is a photo emission analog of this absorption spectroscopy approach. There is now basically these two sides to look at the thing, how such resonances build up. I will go quickly through this because we're almost at the end. <coughs> the question is, from atoms to molecules, you can of course also look at how molecular states would change now as a function of intensity. So this is again the spectrum here in this case of argon compared to nitrogen. It has almost the same IP as an argon atom. And you can see that for highly excited states, the intensity dependence is almost the same on these states. But for lower states, of course, for highly the highly excited states don't know much whether the molecule, whether it's a molecule or an atom, because they are so far away from the, from the cores that they don't even notice whether it's just singly, uh, a singly ionized atom or a singly ionized molecule that's sitting there, because it's just a pool of potential outside to all of them. But for states that get progressively closer now to this atomic or molecular core, you see differences. And we're wondering still about what this is. So this is something that we're still actively working on. And this is just the beginning, just argon and nitrogen. There could be way more complex molecules. And there was even also here the first shot at these things where one could see that with the modified Fano phase model, you can capture some changes that appear now as a function of intensity in even such a very complex molecule, even in solution. So it seems like this is a very general approach in strong fields to understand the responses of systems and to make sense out of it, how basically the strong field is modifying these systems. So this is, uh, this is interesting for the future. The other thing that I would like to point out is this was now all related to harmonic generation, XUV spectroscopy, how the spectral structure is changing. And for the very few last minutes, unfortunately, I was too slow for, uh, in the first part, I would like to flash through a bit of this free electron laser work that where you can also see how a molecule is changing in an intense optical field. People know they want to measure individual molecules with X-ray diffraction. And of course, there's this problem that the molecule gets destroyed in this process. But basically, so there's also work by the Buchsbaum group who do this now even on molecules, very small molecules in an ensemble. So this seems to work in ensemble molecules. You can dif get diffraction really of molecules in the X-ray domain and even look at dynamics of a wave packet that is formed. This was all done by the Buchsbaum group here, very recently published in here, if you're interested. Our question was, can we look directly at a molecule as it gets changed, modified in an intense IR field? Can we directly in situ look at how the molecule is changed when an IR field, an intense one, interacts with it? And the short story, uh, the message just shortly, this was a uh, just to introduce how you calculate such images. You all know this eval sphere. I just want to make the point sometimes for calculating. It's for single molecules easier to do this directly in real space and to look at the paths, the diffraction paths, and add them up because there's a direct, very nice, effective numerical way to map basically then to the diffraction pattern rather than to calculate the Fourier transform and on a curved eval sphere is much more complicated. The Fourier transform is helpful in a lot of, uh, a lot of ways, but not here uh, so much. 
So this was the original idea. Let me skip all this. The proposal that was written really basically saying changing shape in a strong field. Can we see this directly? And it turns out, yes, we can. So the, 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 you can now do experiments, diffractive imaging on molecules as they interact with an intense field and look directly into the dynamics that unfolds. And what you see for different intensities, you get different basically dynamical regimes where the molecule basically expands and then fragments in different ways. I won't say much, just that you can really already start to see a change in the horizontal and vertical along the laser polarization and the opposite to it, it seems the expansion velocities or the expansion times are a little bit different. So there's a small discrepancy. At late times, it also looks like there is a change between these two directions. So we basically can look now at symmetry breaking in strong field interactions directly and image these processes with these X-ray fields. And this opens a lot of opportunities. I won't talk about this. The apparatus, just for you to, to see this, what the experiment looks like. Here there's this oven that actually came from Nora Ferrer's group, where she here was modified by Kirsten Schnorr to match with the heat shield, basically because you move your CCD detectors very close to get the diffractive image of this. This was a huge challenge to get this working, and it did. In the end, so you see here, large teams are needed for these uh, experiments uh, to make everything work. And this is also all the people basically also on the other things that, uh, that contributed to these results. And the ideas basically that came from this also for work that one can do now in the future on this. And the take home messages really, okay, spectral line shapes are changing in strong laser fields and you can make sense out of these changes. You can now really get quantitative metrology parameters that you can extract from these intense field interactions that you can use to compare to theories. You can do other things, for example, resolving as resonances emerge in the time domain. This is completely general. We are currently transforming this even to the X-ray domain and can use it there for creating laser-like light on X-ray transitions. And here, this is another thing um, that, I, that I've quickly showed you how to directly in situ see how a molecule changes its shape, its structural shape in this case, real space shape in, uh, in a strong laser field and look at this with x-rays. And the key goal of course in all these things is also really can you understand this completely for general systems and can you use this at some point even to control, to use control chemical reactions and all these things. It's kind of the driving force behind these strong fields. Physics in also neutrals, can you change the shape of neutral molecules? And with that, I'm at the end, and thanks. Looking forward to your questions. Uh, thank you um, uh, so much, Thomas. It was an uh, uh, inspirational talk, and we learned a lot, but we did it. Um, I just wanted to ask, maybe comment briefly on, on, on these new results uh, from uh, uh, Robert uh, uh, at a clock's measurement. Uh, right. uh, I, uh, usually, other clock experiments are done with short pulses, and because of strong nonlinearity, you know that the center of the pulse is really your time zero. And then, by offset from this time zero, you know is there is any delay or not. If you do this with very, this very long pulse, you have a, a sort of smooth rise and fall of this pulse, and you don't really know what's your time zero. And if you do this in this mixture with different ionization potential, this time zero for these two different atoms can be actually different. That's right. So all this is taken into account in the theory, I have to say. So what you're saying is true, that for a longer pulse, for example, you have to even include things like saturation, as you have to do anyway, right? Also for a short pulse, you will have some depletion until you reach the top of the pulse. So always these things need to be taken into account. And of course, also the different ionization potentials also need to be taken into account, and it was done. So in this theory that I showed by Christoph Keitel and uh, um, 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 Enderhalt Jakob Boilu was the main, main person doing this theory, they included the different ionization potentials in this, in this theory. And then still we looked at the difference between this. So basically all was boiling down to looking at a difference in these angles, taking still into account the differences in ionization potentials of polarizability, even of the different effective wave functions that the electrons come out 
of the krypton and argon, of course, are much different from each other using effective potentials to describe the electron, the outer electron. So all this is in, uh, contained in the theory. Uh, was there any particular reason why they measured this with a uh, long, uh, long pulse? With a long pulse? Because it's just the more, in that particular experiment, it was just the most stable situation that you could get. If you could, would have used a very short pulse, the pulse would probably not have stayed stable to that level as it does for this more standard pulse. That was basically the reason. The measurement was in the extraction of that very, very fine angle was just more robust than doing it with a long pulse. Uh, is this on? Yeah, it is on. No. Okay. Uh, so you showed at the end of the first part uh, some experiments with molecules, I think even in solution. Yes, that's right. Uh, where you have extremely fast dephasing times on hundreds of femtoseconds usually. So how do you see this ringing of the slow decay that takes place over nanoseconds of radiative decay usually? Ah. That you see uh, some... Yeah. This we would not see because if it's really that slow, then the spectral resolution would definitely anyway not be enough. So what, what we looked at here is basically, and I have to say this also, this was done in the optical, so this was not even an XUV pulse, this was really an optical absorption spectrum. This is a laser dye molecule which is absorbing in the optical domain. And uh, what you could see is here just this broad feature develops a, a fine structure as you go up in intensity. And this is reproduced by assuming this bunch of Lorentzian transitions which is just really a toy model approach. This has nothing to do with reality, but the, of course the band structure is composed of several transitions and some of them could be long lived. But the key, what we only see in absorption is the dephasing. Basically, as long as, as, as soon as they are dephased, we will not see it. The absorption band is really the Fourier transform, again, the imaginary part, Fourier transform of the ringing dipole. And of course it rings only as long as it has not completely decohered. You know? This is the point. So of course we can only look on the time scales of decoherence, but what it seems like we can somehow, the spectrum gets narrower, it develops a narrow feature as you increase the laser intensity. So what that means is that you can actually now play with this coherence or the decoherence to make it longer, right? Because it develops narrow features means that somehow the strong field changed now, somehow the transition such that the decoherence does not happen anymore in that way it did before. So it may have shifted the resonance to a place where they kind of are more separated from each other, live longer, the coherence time is longer, and this is kind of what you see in this narrow, that in the development of this narrow feature in the experiment. Yeah. What happens at very long times, we cannot say here, that is, that is the point. But this could be done later, right? So you could set up a more highly resolving spectrometer and all these things. This is really just the very first step. And we will probably, that I should also say, we will not ourselves proceed with that, probably because we are, this turns quickly into more, you need more chemical knowledge than we as simple-minded physicists would have about such critters. We don't know anything about this. And it turns out even we asked some chemists, they are also a bit scared to calculating exactly what this looks. Okay, okay, that's great to hear. Yeah. Okay. In, in one of your slides, you showed something about frustrated uh, tunnel ionization. So I wanted to know what is, why it is called frustrated. Okay, the term frustrated came from the fact that it was saying, um, it looks like it's tunnel ionization. So it's an intense field that would actually produce tunnel ionization. But the mechanism that happens is basically the electron would tunnel, but afterwards it will not be driven away. Some projectors, as you know probably, will be driven away from the atom, so they are ionized. But of course yeah. many transitions, many, many trajectories will just come back and oscillate around in the vicinity of the atom. And you could argue that those trajectories were never really in the continuum. So they were not even ionized, because if you subtract for those trajectories the influence of the electric field, in the atom, which is basically this PA term, if you write in the velocity gauge, or E times R, you would find out, if you subtract this, that the electron is still bound. Yeah. It will still stay bound. And this is why the authors here who did this said, 
well, there is some projectors that looks like it's tunnel ionized. The tunnel is anyway just there in this real space representation. So this is, as again, a very dangerous kind of field, but it was never really ionized, right? And it just stays there, and in the end, it's bound. You know? And so frustrated because it looks like it's tunneling, but not really. In the end, it was bound. Yeah, exactly. Yes. Hydrogen. Or yes. <laughs> we're, we're trying hydrogen. It's not. You, it's not the easiest, just from an experimental point of view. That is the yeah. point. But we're trying, and we're getting there. This would be very interesting. Yeah. The only problem is that we could not really control the internuclear separation in these experiments, right? And the problem is. This, in these absorption experiments, you don't have this advantage of measuring in situ or basically, no, not in situ, but after the fact, from the kinetic energy release, for example, at what, at what uh, separation it happened, because you just have the photons and you measure on an ensemble. So it's not a single molecule experiment where you could do coincidence. At some point, we hope we can combine this maybe, uh, this will take a while. There is ideas to do that, but this would com require completely different approaches. To, to do absorption, bring it together with coincidence, photo emission and stuff. This would be really exciting if one could do that, yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, if there's no more questions, yes, thank you again. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Now you're experimental, right? Yeah, so